Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Google Cloud Talks by DevRel. Google Cloud Talks by DevRel is an ongoing series of sessions presented by Google Developer Advocates to address the topics that are most important to you, the developer community. Today's session focuses on practical AI, and you can always find out more info about upcoming sessions, and you can register on our site, which we've linked down below in the description. And if there's topics you'd like to see in the future, feel free to share them with us on the QA, Q&A. So let's get started with today's speakers. First up, we're gonna have Lee Boonstra. She's a conversational AI developer advocate at Google, and she'll share with us a best practice for streaming audio from a browser microphone to Dialogflow or Google Cloud speech to text by using WebSockets. Super pumped for that. After that, we'll have Zach Akil. He's a machine learning engineer and developer advocate who's based in London, and he likes to build vision and video-based demos. Then we'll have our third speaker, Dale Markowitz, who is a machine learning engineer and developer advocate based out of Texas, and she works on natural language processing and translation. And we'll actually also have a fourth person who will help moderate a panel. We're going to have a panel for all our speakers at the end, so definitely stick around for that. Get your questions answered, and um, that will be moderated by Dave Elliott. He's a developer advocate who works with developers who want to implement AI in their applications. So we've got everybody on. Um, let's find them here. How is everybody doing? Here they are, all of our fabulous speakers. Hey, how you been? Well, um, yeah, hey, great everyone. to see you all. <laughs> and everybody who's hello. who's watching, you know, feel free to say hello in the live chat. Let us know where you're uh, joining us from and what um, what you've been up to this weekend. Uh, for those based in the U.S., this was a long weekend, Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully you got a chance to maybe get outside a little bit, not be completely uh, stuck at home. <laughs> and um, maybe you got to, um, I don't know, learn some new new technologies, play it around with some new tools in your spare time. And let's see, yeah, and maybe, maybe our speakers can share with us a little bit about what they've been up to, what they're excited about. For me, you pretty much got it right. I went outside and I learned technology. <laughs> Was the technology outside? I wish. I can't wait to go back to a coffee shop. Yeah, coffee shops. Ooh. I mean, I went the opposite way. I actually got more into technology. I got a VR headset. Oh. And I, for the first time, I played a VR game with one of my friends who's based in Berlin, which was just incredible experience. That's super cool. <laughs> Well, and I just played Star Wars Fallen Jedi the whole weekend, so. <laughs> nice. That's pretty fun. <laughs> such, a, such a great, such a great uh, group of, of, of activities. I played with a, a, a language model, a BERT model, to try to figure out how to, to, to better process uh, a whole bunch of medical publications. Not very exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, it was actually pretty fun. Awesome. Well... Let's see. It's uh, 12.04 coming on 12.05. Um, let's take a look at the live chat before we, we go to our first presenter. We got people joining us from all over the world. We got Mexico City. Somebody's watching from all the way from India, from London. There's somebody, one of your pals, Zach. <laughs> uh, another viewer from India saying hello. So hi, everybody. Um, you know, Stephen, Carlos, Abhishek, David, uh, Chetan, Chetan. Chitan, um, and Tibor, who is a, a, uh, what a frequent viewer of this channel. Great to have you on the live stream. Uh, familiar faces now after that Quick, lab, quick Labs challenge, yes. Uh, a, a hello from all the way from South Africa. That's amazing. Uh, I had a chance to go to South Africa about two years ago, back when we still can tr could travel, and it definitely is the sort of thing that we now kind of look back upon fondly, right? All of our, our former former travels. So nobody asked you, what did you do this weekend, you think? <laughs> what did I do this weekend? Uh, I was thinking about making some bread, but then I forgot. So I'll have to do that at some point this week because I'm out of bread. I hope you fed your sourdough starter. My sourdough starter, that's funny. I actually have never made sourdough, um, as shocking as it is. I've been making bread in a bread machine since bef well before this whole thing started. So I'm both neither fancy nor a n new starter to bread making. Not joining the hype train, but also never was on the hype train. So I don't know which, <laughs> which way that is. 
Uh, I tried making bread once without a bread machine and then concluded I needed a bread machine. Too much of a mess to clean up, so how it goes. All right, so with with that said, um, let's let's have everybody, let's have Lee get us started. Um, and we'll uh, have each of our presenters coming on as things, um, as each person finishes, and we'll kind of uh, have them all back on at the end for the panel. Yeah. So Lee will get presenting here, and um, yeah, we'll let uh, take it away, Lee. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about building your own custom voice AI assistant, and uh, we'll do that by streaming your 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 spoken voice through a browser microphone via WebRTC to Dialogflow or Cloud Speech. And um, then Dialogflow will detect some intents and we will get the speech back in the browser so it can play. So, I will, so you can expect some cool demos and uh, the architecture and a lot of code. So what is an AI voice assistant? Well, it's actually just an intelligence software agent that can perform tasks for an individual based on commands and questions through human speech, and uh, it responds via synthesized voices. So think about the Google Assistant or Siri or Alexa. Um, but why would you build your own voice AI if we have a Google Assistant? And why, why should you do all this effort to build it yourself? Um, well, there are some good reasons for that. Because when you and, and the people that have built Google Assistant apps in the past, they might know this. Like when you build a Google Assistant app, or we call that an action, uh, you need to invoke it with uh, the wake words by saying, hey, Google, talk to my app. And then your application is publicly available and it runs across all other apps from other people and next to the native features from the Google Assistant. But it will run on all Google Assistant powered devices. So that can be a Google Home, it can be also on your smart TV or a watch. Um, and it comes with consumer terms and conditions. And it has a bunch of special technical requirements, such as the microphone cannot be open uh, longer than, uh, what is it, 30 seconds. So these are all reasons that are great if you want to bring your brand to the public and you want to receive lots of traction on the, the because of the Google ecosystem. But when you're building your own app that does not need to be on the Google Assistant ecosystem, or you have special technical requirements, like you want to stream and keep the microphone open for a very long time, or maybe you're an enterprise and you need to have enterprise terms and conditions, and then it's a way better use case to build it yourself in the Google Cloud. And the good thing is that we can do this all because we have all the conversational AI tools. Some use cases uh, that I came up with for building your own custom AI voice assistant. Some of them I even worked on with customers uh, myself, uh, but you can think of a, a self-service kiosk. These are the kiosks that you can see on an airport or in a train station, and you can start interacting with it through voice. Um, you can also think of websites where voice is integrated, for example, to search on a website instead of typing it out. Yeah, you can just press a button and start speaking to it. Um, maybe you're building an app for a smartwatch. Maybe you have your own hardware, like you see here on the slide, like a cool Raspberry Pi, and you want to run your own application with voice on it. Or maybe you want to build a car navigation system. These are all reasons uh, yeah, where before you can build your own um, AI for. And especially now eh, with the corona time, uh, you probably are not really a fan of uh, touching uh, a, in a public screen on an airport. And it's better that, that you don't touch it at all and just use your voice. And the last uh, use case, um, yeah, that's of course the, the AI in contact centers. So robots that pick up the phone for you. Now, typically we have a product for this. It's called contact center AI. So you don't need to build all the steps manually because it's already out of the box there for you. But all the other uh, use cases like delivering your own hardware or building your own app in a website or in your own uh, mobile app, yeah, that is a great use case for building an, your own custom AI voice assistant. Um, just one little thing before I uh, start showing some code, there is another huge difference between the Google Assistant versus uh, streaming your, your own uh, application. And it is that a Google Assistant, it works with short utterances. So for example, I say, hey, Google, turn off the lights. 
That's simple, right? It's just one sentence and the Google system can act on that. But when you think about streaming uh, audio in a contact center or in a self-service kiosk, you can expect that people have a whole lot of stories with all types of people and all sub stories in mingled in between. Then it's even for a human already difficult to figure out like what's the intent. Uh, it's also difficult for a machine, but with tools like Dialogflow and, and machine learning tools within Google Cloud, we can do this all. Uh, we can do long utterances uh, and streaming and uh, yeah, get the results uh, in real time on the screen. So what I'm going to show you now is a best practice for streaming audio from a browser uh, to Dialogflow uh, by using WebSockets. And I'll first show you um, the example application that I had built. And this is an example self-service kiosk. Of course, it's fake. Um, I'm using Dialogflow here, and Dialogflow is actually fetching FAQs from, from various airport websites. Um, so it can uh, give me an answer. And I'm only reading English content in, but you will see in my application that I'm actually uh, using uh, other languages as well. So I'm translating it also in real time on the fly. But let's uh, yeah, have a demo here. What time is boarding? Transport and security checks and boarding can take longer than expected. Per airport, these times may also vary. To prevent delays, we ask that you arrive at both the airport and the gate on time, especially during the busy holiday travel seasons. Now you can see that I could ask a question and it will uh, fetch the answer and then it will uh, speak it out to me. I did this in English, in English. Let me just try it one more time, but then in my own native language, I'm Dutch. I live in Amsterdam. So uh, let's see if it um, um, works also when I uh, translate it. Um, Hoe laat moet ik bij de gate zijn? Paspoort en veiligheidscontroles en instappen kunnen langer duren dan verwacht. Ook per luchthaven kunnen deze tijden verschillen. Om vertragingen te voorkomen, vragen we je om op tijd op de luchthaven en bij de gate te arriveren. So yeah, that's perfect Dutch. And I support all these languages because I'm translating on the fly. And then I get the result, and then I'm translating the, it back so that the text to speech can also, uh, yeah, pronounce it in the right language. Cool, isn't it? Now, how did I build this? Well, here's the architecture, and actually, this is on my GitHub page. And after uh, my presentation, I will share with you the URL so you can dive into the code yourself and check it out. But what I'm doing here is within the Google Cloud, I created basically two containers. Uh, the first container is the web app, the, the client, and in my case, this is an Angular app. And uh, the Angular app talks to a Node.js backend via WebSockets. I'm going to show you that in a couple of seconds. Then the Node.js server talks to all the various Google Cloud APIs, such as speech-to-text to take my spoken voice and translate it to written text. Then I'm translating it uh, to English. So the so my, my native language yeah, is Dutch, but I'm translating it to English because Dialogflow has the, the English intents imported. I get the result from Dialogflow. I translate it back to my, uh, my native language. In my case, this will be uh, to Dutch. And then I am uh, speaking it, I'm reading it out uh, with text-to-speech. And this all is deployed, in my case, uh, with App Engine Flex uh, because uh, it needs to run on HPS. So an SSL certificate and uh, with App Engine Flex, that was just easy because you just need to write an app deploy command and uh, you get the SSL uh, certificate for free. So with that said, let's have a look. What you see here, this is the front end code. Uh, this is the Angular code. And in the Angular uh, application, uh, you saw like I have like a button and that button will start the microphone. And and uh, that microphone will make use of uh, WebRTC. This is just uh, uh, HTML5, uh, get user media. I, um, these type of apps never will work on iOS, uh, other browsers than Safari, but um, with record RTS, at least it works on iPads. Yeah, so uh, once you're creating the... Wait, I... yeah. it's for everybody else also. Uh... You can 
you can still hear me? Yeah, hey Lee, sorry, we had a slightly hiccup there. We were on talking about just a few lines above uh, when you were starting, like maybe 30 seconds back. Yeah, okay. just the beginning of this function. So I mentioned uh, to, yeah, okay. So I mentioned before uh, that uh, it will work on iOS, but you only need to uh, make sure it runs on Safari because other browsers than Safari on iOS are not real browsers. They're basically browser frames inside of an app. Uh, so it needs to run, uh, if you want to use it on mobiles, on iOS specifically, then it needs to run on Safari. And uh, for the rest, it works across every other browser because of the library record RTC that I'm using. So this is a library to make sure that it runs across all browsers. Yeah. It get user media, again, that is the HTML5 uh, uh, WebRTC method to fetch the browser stream and record RTC, I'm using this to make sure it works across all browsers. So it works not only on my MacBook, but also on Windows machines and also on iPads or uh, Pixel phones, you name it. Now you need to configure this stream. And uh, this, um, this stream, yeah, you say like, yeah, it's audio because record RTC could support audio or audio and video. I set it to WebM, that's fine. Uh, then I need to com come up with a sample rate and this should be the sample rate um, that your browser comes in with. So that in, this will be uh, 44.1 uh, kilohertz. Um, it, it, when you work with sample rates, then you, and you work with Google Cloud libraries like or APIs like Dialogflow or speech to text, uh, you need to make sure that the sample rate is the same in your server code. Now, in my server code, I've set this to 16,000. Uh, so I'm using desired sample rate to downsize it to make sure that the stream is very small. Uh, so that makes it uh, makes sending it quicker. Another important thing here is I set the recorder type to stereo audio recorder. This uh, allows me to set it to stereo. Uh, even though cloud speech to text and dialogue flow don't support stereo, they support mono, but the stereo audio recorder allows you to set the number of audio channels and then I can set it back to one. Uh, the last important uh, setting here is the time slice. The way how streaming works is basically I'm going to send chunks of streams to my backend. And what I'm trying to do is every five seconds, I send uh, some bits to the backend server. That's long enough to fetch some sentences because you don't want to have it too quick because then dialogue flow cannot really uh, detect anything on it because then it's just words. So you need to give some context. Uh, but I wouldn't go too long because then basically you're waiting till the stream is all recorded and sent. And I want to make it like near real time. Um, on the on data available uh, uh, method, I'm making sure that the, 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 the stream, the blob, will be um, sent to an Angular service. I made this service myself, which will make sure that uh, yeah, we're sending the binary stream to the backend. This is what I'm doing here. So I am um, sending, I'm using WebSockets, or in my case, socket.io, which is a library in, in Node.js, uh, to send, uh, send it through sockets or bidirectional streams to the backend. And uh, I give it a name of the method, it's passing the stream. I also give some metadata like the stream name and what is important, the, the target language. So the language of the selected flag. So that way I can translate it later back. Okay. Then uh, I am basically, uh, now I'm gonna move to the Node.js code base. And this will be also, uh, since this is Node.js code, this will be also JavaScript code. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do here is, this is the, the Node.js code, as you can see. And uh, in this Node.js code, I am basically starting in an Express server. I need to make sure that I use Socket.io. And um, then I'm listening till I get the event, uh, the stream speech event in. And the stream speech event comes in once, the, once there are like five second chunks uh, sending to the, to the backend. Um, and this will invoke my, uh, my method uh, speech stream to text. So this way, now we can start doing the fun stuff, uh, which is, uh, the cloud speech to text and the translate. I'm doing it, I'm concatenating these two methods that are right after each other. So I'll first start with, um, with creating a speech to text call. So this is what I set up here. And this is just a Node.js uh, library from Google Cloud that you can include in your Node application. Uh, you, you create the speech client. 
speech to text, and then you configure it. And now this is important. Again, you need to make sure that you set the sample rate the same as your desired sample rate from the browser. If you don't do that well, then your, your streams uh, won't match and uh, Dialogflow cannot make uh, any detects out of it because yeah, the, it didn't really understand what was being said. Um, encoding is also important. You need to make sure that that's uh, also the same. And uh, here I'm just setting some additional parameters, so also automatic uh, punctuation, make sure that it knows, knows when to end the sentence. Um, yeah, and then some additional settings for choosing a model. I'm choosing near field because in my application, I'm always sure that I'm standing next to the microphone. Uh, if you're further away from a microphone, yeah, you can set it to, for example, midfield. Yes, then we're translating the application, or we, speech to text, and it took the spoken text and, uh, and transformed it to written text. Now that we have the written text, uh, we translate it to the base language if it's other than English. And uh, it, like in the case of when I was speaking Dutch, yeah, I need to translate this to English first. And that is what I'm doing with the, the Google Translate uh, methods here. I'm, I'm using the translation client and it uses a promise. I say translate text and I take the request what is it, what's in the request? Well, in the request is written, um, and there is written the, the cloud uh, project ID that I'm using, and then I'm add, uh, adding the text to it. Yeah. Cool. Now that I have to translate the text to English, now I can finally start using dialect flow because I want to make uh, some, I wanted to detect what's been asked. And in dialect flow, you can create intent or I'm using what I, what I mentioned before, I can import FAQs just very quickly. In dialect flow, you can train an intent with certain training phrases and then it knows what to answer. This is a default uh, hard-coded answer, but when you want to uh, work with um, like uh, websites that uh, specify the, uh, the contents, which is what I'm doing for the airports, you can use a knowledge base, which is in beta, and a knowledge base allows you to import websites and um, further then it, it reads in all the types of questions that you can ask and it will automatically send the answer. So again, you see it's all English, it's not in Dutch, but it will be translated and uh, then it will be sent back. So that makes us here. We're now in dialect flow. We have the result. Now what we need to do is we need to translate it back from English to the language of the flag. So in my case, Dutch, and then we need to speak it out. So in dialect flow, we're in the Node.js application, we need to integrate the Dialogflow SDK, which is what I'm doing here. You uh, typically, the way how you set up Dialogflow in the SDK is you make sure that you have a session ID. And um, this is just a generated ID, a generated number, it can be anything, but it needs to be unique. Uh, so that's why I'm generating it. I'll create the Dialogflow session client, and I specify the, the project ID of my Dialogflow project into it to make sure that it's connected to my dialog flow account and that it's unique because of the session ID. So that way um, nobody else can, can interrupt your chat. Uh, you create a request and the request contains the session path and it needs to have some query inputs with the language code. This is the language code that I'm, uh, I'm using in dialog flow, so English. And, and then I can start doing a detect intent. Uh, so you say uh, request query input text text is the text that dialect flow that I am sending to dialect flow and then I have created a promise with the detect intent method and it will return me an answer the answer that is the answer that we pass into text to speech to make sure that uh, text to speech um, will return us the 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 right voice. So that's what we're doing here. I set up a text-to-speech request uh, where I assign an uh, SSML gender. So like what kind of voice do you want? A male voice, female voice, or neutral voice. The audio config, again, this needs to have audio encoding. So you can set it to a linear 16. That is the way how the browser handles it. You can set it to MP3 or any other um, uh, like OG Opus, but then you need to work with a converter again so that just make sure that you need, then you need to have extra code. Um, right. 
now we're gonna do the the call itself so from text to speech this is what uh, the promise does here so from the client i run synthesized speech where i specify the 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 request and then i get an audio stream back but we're not done yet because where we are now is we have now in the node.js application an audio stream but what we need is that this audio stream will be played back automatically in the web client so that it out of place so we're going back to the angular app now and here in the angular app we can make sure that the websocket sent it back to the angular app and once we're in the angular app what we're going to do here is we're going to use again webrtc and in this case what what this method does is we're creating an audio context where we create a buffer and we assign the stream to it and then we connect it to our output in this case that will be our speakers uh, so we set that destination and then i'm doing like a little trick here because i figured out that on ios they block it they, they block auto play uh, ios devices don't want you to uh, automatically play uh, audio so what my trick here is is i start stop it and then i resume it and then i can play the audio and yeah that way you're you have the whole pipeline of all the, the pieces all together it's just like lego it's just connecting all the apis to each other to build a final solution like this and again i deployed it in app engine to make sure that i have an https url right so with that said um here's the link if you want to try this out yeah, it is open source code you can go to this url you can uh, check it out you can uh, make some uh, request pull request if you want and i'll, I'll look into it uh, but this is definitely a great starting point um, it, it, i think this is definitely something that can be helpful for you um, because what i figured out is like building solutions like these is always difficult and it's not difficult because the google cloud apis are difficult no it's difficult because you're using so many different technologies all connected to each other um, with all having certain specs so this is a great uh, start point thank you very much awesome thanks lee yeah yeah so that was really interesting. Um, reminder to folks who are watching that we do have a Q and A um, running. It's in, let's let me drop the link up here. So feel free to you know ask your questions there, and we will um, you know show them as they come in. Additionally, we have the live chat, so feel free to just drop your questions in there that you're curious about. Um, I know for for those of you who are just joining, you know, Lee just gave us this really interesting presentation about kind of doing this real-time um, dialogue flow kind of chat and, and asking answers. So like she's saying something, it's turning into text, it's getting sent over the wire, converted into an answer and then said back. So it's really a fantastic end-to-end -end example and real kind of yeah. use case, which is really, really neat. Um, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting how you, know, you were able to walk us through all of those kind of small audio settings, right? There are many, many <laughs> settings that you had to kind of figure out. So um, I'm really curious, how, what yeah. was that experience like sorting through bit rates and encodings and compression? Just to, just to mm -hmm. be honest, I built this code now three times and every time I throw it out and I started over again, mm -hmm. like, no, there must be a better way. I think the very first time when I did it, I had a problem with that it didn't work across all browsers. The second time when I tried it, I it was working, but then it uh, I could only record one piece of text and I couldn't keep it uh, running for longer than a minute. And then finally, I figured out all the right tools all uh, all together to make a working solution. And that's that was the moment when I thought like, yeah, now this is the time where we should make a best practice out of it. And, uh, Host it, uh, make it open source, and since that, since I hosted it open source, I got like lots of reactions and people saying like, yeah, this is very useful. This is exactly what I try to do. Yeah, amazing. That's super cool. And let me take a look at the um, Q and A here. We don't have any questions just yet. Maybe people will ask um, later in the panel. Um, meanwhile, sure. let's uh, let's have Zach uh, join us, and and we can yeah. um, let him get started with his presentation. Mm -hmm about kind of doing cool stuff with Google Forms. 
Hey, Zach. Oh. All right. Well, good luck, Zach. Oh, okay. oh, here we go. All right. So Zach's going to share his screen, and it's going to be a, kind of a shift here. We're going to pivot over to talking about connecting Google Forms, I believe, with and making them a little bit more interesting <laughs> with some ML. You know, it's definitely two areas that yeah, you wouldn't, wouldn't think of connecting <laughs> off the top of off the top of your head. But yeah. See you, Lee. Yeah. Um, thanks for. Good luck. See yeah, you we'll later. see you in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, Zach, you all set? I am all set, ready all to right. go. Take it away. All right, thank you very much, Yu Fang. So yes, hello everyone. I am Zach Akil. I'm a machine learning developer advocate based in London. Uh, hello to everyone in the chat who's from all over the world, especially those who are my neighbors here in London and back in my home in Northern Ireland. Uh, what I'm going to go through today is this cool technology that I've kind of stumbled across that I, I like to use. Well, let me, let me just let me get right into it. So I like to build apps. I love to build apps. Uh, I won't deny it. And uh, the kind of apps I build are, are not your standard apps. So I like, uh, I like vision and video based machine learning things. And I always like to build like kind of quirky things. So this is, there's a thing I built and then I do, I did some stuff with basketball. I did some stuff with visualizing neural networks. I played around with reinforcement learning to get like tic-tac-toe working. Uh, that's the basketball thing again, there's more basketball. Yeah, so I, I build these kind of things a lot and they all have a use, but I would not say that they're useful. I don't think anyone would say that they're useful. Uh, they all have a use, but they're not, I wouldn't say they're useful mainly because uh, when I built these apps, uh, they weren't built to you know deliver to someone. They weren't they weren't they weren't really delivered. They were designed as kind of um, well demos, effectively, just to show off like you could do this cool thing with a bit of technology. And when I wanted to, when people ask, oh, can I use this? Can I use this thing? It's like I would kind of have to just point them to the source code and be like, here's what you could work with. And that was fine for a while until uh, I actually wanted to build stuff properly because like this is all nice, but I have a, um, my background is in full stack web development and data science. And I recently learned like a bit more about machine learning. So when I'm talking about things like ML APIs and auto MLs and how to build models, and I say, oh, you can take this and you can put it in an app. Uh, I'm making the unfair assumption that, oh, you can, this API is really cool. So long as you build the entire app infrastructure around it, <laughs> which is, is fine when you're building demos, but it's not so fine when you actually are say working in a company and you have this thing that you want to do with an ML API and you're like, oh, I mean, I know about the API, but I don't know how to actually put it into an application. And so that brings me to, brings me on to saying, okay, I like building apps, but I don't like building useful apps. Uh, what I mean is if you want to build something that someone is actually going to use, uh, you've got to go through the effort of say, putting together a UI that makes sense. Uh, if you're working in some companies, they maybe are used to working with certain tools so that they're not used to, if you build this really quirky API or build this really quirky UI, they're going to be like, I don't know how to use this. I'm not going to use it. That happens a lot. <laughs> uh, so if I want to build it and make it actually useful, I got to make sure that the API or that the the UI for it, uh, it, it makes sense and it's what their people could be used to using. Uh, the next thing is you got to host the app somewhere. There's loads of options to host apps out there. Still can be a bit tedious, especially if, again, like I say, if you're working within a company and you've got this application you want to build uh, and you only want it available for people in that company, that can be tricky if your company doesn't already have like an intranet set up. And a bit of a horror story, I was working in a company and I was building like a little quirky app that was supposed to be useful for people. And how I shared it was I like saved it as the HTML file and emailed it to people for people to then put on their desktop and open it. It was shameful. It was a shameful way to do it, but it was, it was simple. So I did it that way. And I had the whole app in an HTML file. It was terrible. But anyway, yeah, hosting the app somewhere and making it like uh, individually accessible to people. Again, yeah, working in a company, making it exposed to a company is one thing. Making it exposed to just people within the company is even is even trickier. So you got to work out some way to log into it. 
which is a whole other bag of worms. However, there's tools like Fire, Firebase, which handle a lot of this for you, which is what I use a lot now. But that still implies you have to build like the front end and all that and connect it together. Uh, so it's assuming a lot. And then finally, uh, all the crud that goes with your with your app. You might have, well, I, I like building the sort of the quirky bit of the app, but then you got the responsible bit of the app, which is, okay, how do you get data in? How do you get data out? How do you delete data? All that stuff, very tedious. I don't like doing it, so I don't. Until I came across AppScript. Uh, if no one uh, has used, if, if you haven't heard of AppScript yet, you're welcome because this thing is amazing. Uh, when I first like saw a demo built with AppScript, I was like, this is so cool. I don't have to do anything. And if I can build functionality into something that tools that people are already used to using, things like Google Sheets, like everyone, everyone kind of knows how Google Sheets works. Uh, if I can build extra functionality into that, that can be my, my sort of my app, my demo. And it's actually a useful thing because it's very easy to just share it with say a group of people or an individual and built into sheets, you've got all the crud for your data. So everyone knows how to remove cells, add, add data and stuff. So it seems to fix all the problems, which, which, which I hated with building useful things, but yeah, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I want to show it. I've got a plethora of, uh, of demos to show now. And actually, uh, if you go to, this is, let me make sure this is going to show properly and it's a decent size. Okay. So if you go to the app script, if you search app script, uh, you'll get to this website. There's the, the documentation for app script is phenomenally good. Uh, you're able to connect, uh, pretty much any G suite app to any other G suite app. And anything you can do normally within, say, like in, in a slide document, add an image, you can do that programmatically with code and it's incredible. It means you can build so much functionality. Maybe you've got, uh, some software that you're using to build maybe like project management charts and you need to export that into a slide because you need to present it. Uh, you can build that with app script. You can build a custom connector. That's going to say, okay, given, given this object, it's going to create a little box there, a little box there, a little arrow there. It can all be done and all automated and made incredibly useful. Let me, let me show you, let me just show you an example here. So let me go into say my uh, Google sheets here. I'm going to create a blank sheet and okay. I'm in, I'm in my, my blank document here. Let me add some extra functionality and how we do that, how we get into app script and make sure I'll zoom this in to make it a bit. Okay. Got it. Let me add some functionality real quick. So I'll go tools, script editor and boom. We're now in app script. What functionality we're going to add? I've got some code here, which I'm going to copy over. I just want to get, get us started, uh, built into this based on whatever app you're in, you can look at different events that are happening. So common one is on open. So whenever someone opens a document, what's going to happen? Like, well, let's do something super cool. Let's interact with the actual UI. So we're going to look at the spreadsheets UI and I'm going to add a little button. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to go create menu. This is going to add to the toolbar. Uh, I'm going to call it, just, I'm just going to keep it. Let's keep it. Let's go slow to begin with. I'm going to go test. And then I'm going to add an item to it. Uh, do, do, do add item. Really nice. It tells me what I can do. I'm going to say, call this um, smile. And then the function is going to call, uh, I'm going to create a function that's going to be, I don't know, uh, insert smile. What, what's this going to do? It's going to give a thing, 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 and then I'm going to run a function that does this. Okay. I need to create that function. Let me do that. And what's this going to do? Okay. Let's just do some real quick. Cause then I've got bigger and better demos to show. Yes. What's this going to do? Well, first we need to get the current spreadsheet we're looking at. It is very, very small on the screen. Let me get that a bit bigger. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to get the current spreadsheet. That's going to save it as a little object there. And then in the spreadsheet, get active sheet, get the range. Let me specify a range. Let me specify a random range three, three set value. And let's set this to a smile. All right. Give it a project name untitled will do. This is going to save now what? Well, we'll go back to our, our Google sheet and I'll check the chat. Do, do, do. 
Okay, everything's good. I'll go back to my sheet. Okay, what's what's changed? Well, nothing yet. We need to open the document. So I'll refresh. The app script will automatically run, or it should automatically run. And we should hopefully, if it is working, and if it's working, I'll look back at this and make sure it's going to call on open, get UI. Yep, yep, yep. Maybe the first time it runs, it takes a while. Let's see. Let's see. Let's try to open it again. Oh, the suspense. Working, working, working. One thing we can do, what's really nice about App Script is it's got a pretty good debugger. I'm not gonna go through the debugging. I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna get sucked into debugging this, even though I'm very tempted to. But what's cool, it's got a little project menu. You can look at all the executions. You can see this one did complete. And then it so yeah. Okay, that one that one didn't work. That one didn't work. Hey Zach. Um I'm sure I'd probably that one all hey, the time. Oh, maybe it, can I yep. can I throw out an idea, a theory at least? I'm gonna Go interrupt your presentation with an idea. Um, it's interesting to me that it's calling a function by string. Like you put the string insert smile there. How is it tying? Yeah. It, it's it knows to link that string to the name of the function. That's remarkable. It does do that. Yeah, it does. Uh, I've got this my example code here, and that is how That's I amazing. did it. Ah, it, you have to click the yeah, UI element, great. don't you? It is. It's there's this thing I forgot ah. to add. <laughs> that was good. You got me. You got me thinking about it. Perfect. Okay, so I got a. I created this item and I added to you. This is great because you find we're going to be doing this at the end of the week. <laughs> I'm going to get That's you right. to do this right. in our uh, in our coding we session. We do have that coming up. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. That that. Let me let me try that, and then I'll I'll reopen this. And what it's going to happen, it's going to run that script. And hopefully, we're going to get, yay, look at that. We got a little extra button there. Click on this. There's our smile thing. We'll click on that. It's going to ask for authorization because it's the first time we're running this. I'm going to say, yep, give it authorization to run this. Uh, it's going to say, because we've written code, and it's like, are you copy and pasting code around? Make sure you trust the developer. Um, this, I sometimes get this message. I'm just gonna say, yep. Yeah. It's gonna say, okay, do you allow whatever the script is to do these things, which is like edit, create, delete things. I'm like, yep, that's all the crud stuff we want to do. Okay. Now it's approved. We'll hit it again and we will get, look at that. We've got a smiley face there. And what's so cool about this is I can now, it's just, a, it's in the sheet now it's embedded in the sheet. So if you share it with people, share it with a group of people, they can all use this extra functionality. So. That I mean, it's it's a smiley face. It's not much now, but let's take it up a notch. Right after I check, yeah, let's 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 go up a bit more because we're gonna we want to do machine learning with this. So, let's start with some natural language. Uh, we're gonna start with the natural language API. I've got a demo here. Okay, this is similar, suspiciously simple setup. However, uh, I'm 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 double viewing the doc. Let me let me there we go. Okay, you'll see, okay, it all looks normal, but I've added something actually, and you, you can put emojis in there. You can have fun with it. You know, sheets, sheets can be fun. Uh, what happens here? So, I don't know if I should show the result or show the code first. Let's show the code first to build suspense. <laughs> uh, I'll go to the script editor and we can see the code sitting behind this. This one's a bit more, a bit more complex, but let's enhance it here. Make sure it's nice and visible. Okay, so the same setup as before. Uh, I start off, can I hide this? No. Okay. Uh, start off, add a, add a menu thing. Uh, I've got this output column number. I'm going to specify the number two. That's where I'm going to have the output of whatever I'm doing here. This, this, it will run this code, get the current, get the current spreadsheet. Uh, this is going to look at the active cell. So it's going to get whatever cell I've clicked on. Uh, this is going to get the value out of that cell. Cool. I'm going to call it text because I plan to use this to do some text analysis. Sentiment score, get this from the Cloud Natural Language API. Now, if you're not familiar with the Cloud Natural Language API, this uh, is an API. I wonder if I've got it here. Go boop. This is a pre trained machine learning model. 
So it will run natural language analysis on text and you don't need to train any models or supply any data. You just feed it raw text and it will analyze it for you. And one of the cool things it does is it'll tell you the sentiment behind the text. So that's like, if it's a positive or negative state, statement that someone has said. So back in our thing, okay. So we're gonna run this API. I've got the code down here, which is, it's building up the API request that it's gonna send. And this is all in the natural language API docs of how to build this request. Uh, here specifies the URL. Uh, and then in app script, there's a way to call uh, an API, any API, any web API. So it's not just connecting to things within the, the G Suite. It can connect to any API you, you can think of on the web. You can call it with within app script. So here's I'm calling the natural language API pass and it's some JSON. Get the response back, parse the response as JSON, and return back the document sentiment dot score. All right, so it should be kind of clear what's going to happen now. So we're going to come here, pass the text into this, and then spreadsheet get active, uh, sheet get range, pass in to the row number of whatever cell I clicked on. So go to that row and the output column number, which is I specified as two, and set the value as our sentiment score. Okay. So if I come here and I type. This is good. Keep it nice and simple to begin with. I've got my little thing here and I can go sentiment. Hey, so for sentiment that, maybe I do, this is going okay. Maybe not as positive, still pretty positive. Uh, this isn't going great. Perfect. Okay, that's, that's bad. Okay, so here's, here's where it gets really cool. This is all still in sheets and I'm going to keep iterating that like it's a sheet. So I can, uh, do this, put that, go into format. Is that visible? It's it's, I can zoom in a bit to make it a bit clearer. Go into this, go down, go to conditional formatting, be like, Oh, let's make it cool. Let's make a color range. Let's make the number of the minimum be negative one. Let's make the number of the maximum be one. And let's make that color be red. Uh, the maximum, I don't know the maximum is positive. So that'll be green. The minimum is going to be red. Hey, and look at that. Now we've got some conditional formatting of our sentiment. So if you've got thousands of rows, you can get visually quickly where the sentiment is. And if you've got thousands of rows, you can plot that because everyone knows how to put plots into like uh, sheets and stuff. So that's an example of using the NLP API, but I am a big fan of vision and I did promise to do something with forms. So. Let's go over to Google Forms. So if you're not familiar with Google Forms, it's a way to build forms and they're all sort of free and hosted. Uh, I've got one here. I'm gonna make an example because then it's, uh, it's easier to show. So in Forms, you might've been familiar, you can create questions. What's really handy about Google Forms though is that they allow you to add, uh, where is it here? They allow you to, if I go to add a new question, boop, 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 question type, file upload. So you say, oh, do you want to do file upload? Keeping in mind, it's going to upload to your Google Drive. You'll be like, yes. And I can say, okay, only accept images and you can set the maximum size and stuff. So you can create Google Forms that allow you to upload images. Now, what we can do is we can then, because what Google Forms allows you to do is upload and put the responses into you see, I've got it here. So here's, here's my, uh, here's a Google form. I've got, actually, I'll go back to this one. Sorry for jumping around so much. Uh, I've got Google form here through doing vision API tests. So here's one. I do the same thing. I take an image as an input. And if you've ever used Google forms, you may be aware of this feature. So you can have all the answers exported into a, uh, a Google spreadsheet. And then now that we're in Google spreadsheets, we're in our domain. App script can get a hold of it. And we can do some cool stuff. So let's uh, let's look at this. So go here, create a form, create this. Here's here's where all the answers are going to go. Uh, whenever I submit an image, the URL for the Google storage is going to appear here. Don't know if it's visible, but in this column, yeah. And if I look at same as before, I'll I'll look at the script. Uh, I'll dismiss this. Okay. You can see this, the structure I literally copy and pasted from the natural language example, cause it's, it's virtually identical in structure. I create a function. Uh, this is a bit of a different function because it takes in and some event data and I'll, I'll, I'll point out what that event data is soon, but it's going to take in some event data. 
we can make, take out the drive URL, which is at this row. I can set data. I can also get data. So this is going to get the row from uh, that row. Uh, built into AppScript is a way to interact with Google Drive naturally. So I can just use the drive URL, take out the ID of the file, get out the actual image data, so as bytes, and then call the Vision API. You see here, very similar to the natural language API and structure. And I'm going to say, OK, do label detection. If you're not familiar with the Vision API, uh, here it is. So this is the pre-trained Vision model. Uh, you can test it on the docs here. So if I put in, say, uh, let me find a nice picture of a duck, put it in, is it going to ask me to label some data? No, it isn't. Cool. That's a goose, apparently. Is that a goose? Oh, very, very tricky. Gooses and ducks, very similar. Uh, vertebrae, duck, water. Is it? I think it's probably, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a goose expert. Uh, but yeah, it will automatically tell you what's in the image or do its best job at telling you what's in the image. So let's run that every time we submit a form response. So I'll go back to my, where is it? Vision API. Here we go. So yeah, in this API, uh, create this kind of API structure. It can do other things, which we're going to use later on. Uh, again, send a URL, send the request, uh, get out the response, and parse through the response to get the labels. Now, back up to this. So it's going to get the API response, um, log it for debugging purposes, and then set that response to the next column. Be like, OK, wherever that column is, row added, output text column, which I specified up at the top. Say, OK, put, put all those in column three all the responses. OK, it's going to run that. Now, when is it going to run this? Super cool about AppScript, you can attach it to events. So if I go to Edit Current Project Triggers, I can have this run, and I have it here. You can see. I'll zoom out because it's getting a bit crazy with that compressed view. Uh, here is a list of all the triggers for this project. There's only one. You can see here, it's going to be, if I go to Add, you can see the menu I get. So I'm going to run this function. Uh, from the spreadsheet, every time uh, on form submit. So that is the exact same one that I have there. You can see on form submit. Whenever the form gets submitted, it's going to trigger that event. Now you can see where this is going. I'm just going to go for the live demo now. I won't keep you in suspense anymore. Let's, uh, let's view this doc. Let's go image analyze. Let's upload an image. Let's go for the duck. Why not? Duck. Duck.jpg, upload, submit, vision submit. Cool, that's cool. Now, what does it look like from the other end? Go back to my vision API. It's going to do something, maybe. Or have I broken this one too? Who knows? It worked last time. <laughs> oh, the suspense. Let me go to this. Oh, oh, is this one? This would be a shame if this one didn't work because this is like the super cool one. Uh, let me check to see. Okay, this one did complete. It did get the response. This is the debug menu. It did get this. Now, did it put it in the spreadsheet? No, it didn't. That's very strange because it did run. I guess this is what I get for for tweaking with the um with the Vision API or tweaking with the the thing right before I went live. Uh, responses, it definitely got sent. Do you sent. think that it might be that the spreadsheet? Oh, it's back. That was gonna, it's a different Here spreadsheet. I, I, you find your magic with this. Every time you come in, immediately it works. It's like super rubber ducking. Yeah, perfect. So it, it did work. I must have been looking at the wrong spreadsheet. Uh, so here is, here's all the labels. So now, same as before, the magic of it just being a Google Sheet, uh, I'll put in a little bit of a conditional formatting here where it's get all this, exclude that format, conditional formatting, and be like, okay, if it contains the text value duck green, boom. And so imagine you're, you're running a conference that's just for ducks. Uh, everyone uploads like uh, their like conference photo and you're like, okay, we want to make sure it's, it's just ducks. So you run this and then it says, oh, no, this one, it doesn't have a duck in it. And you can see that immediately. This is hard heading use cases. Okay, that's two out of three demos. Final demo, I'm not going to run through the, the code. Actually, I might run through the code. I won't run through the code. 
I might run through the code. Okay, final demo. Let's bring it together. So doing both the vision and the natural language API. The vision API does label detection. It also does OCR, so character recognition. So imagine you've got a feedback system that's kind of analog and you're working with like post-it notes or something and people are leaving feedback in them, but you don't want to go through and type all that in, all that kind of data entry. What if you just had all the photos of the feedback in a Google Drive, you upload the photos through a form. Uh, let's do that right now. So I'm going to go here, going to go look at this form. Uh, add a file. I've got some feedback here. Uh, so I go here, I go boop. Do, do, do. My ducks folder. Here we go. Feedback. Let's, let's upload some feedback. Upload. Submit. Now, I'm too scared to try to find it again. So I'm just going to go here and look at it through here. So I'm going to go boop. Here we go. So we got an image. Let me look at this image. Here's the image. Didn't like the speaker's hair. My handwriting kind of plateaued at primary school. So and what's good is really test the API. Uh, but this is it. So it's first of all, let's, 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 let's just peek. Let's just peek at the code. Uh, similar structure, run this event. Uh, it's I literally copy and pasted from the two examples where uh, it's a bit small, where run the vision API, but this time run the OCR detection. Uh, after I get the text back, uh, run that through the natural language API to get the sentiment score and plop all those back into the Google Sheet. You can see for the vision API, I run the same command, but I pass in document text detection. That's going to analyze it for any sort of text in the image. And when we get back, we can see here and look, sentiment score. Let me, let's try uh, uploading a few more. So I've got some more feedback. Uh, upload, from, well, let's, do, let's do one more. Uh, let's try this one. Oh, cool. I'll upload the cool one. Do that, submit that. And hey, it's there. And then, oh, the app is cool. Let's just make sure that it is what it says. Let's see, let's see the image. Let's see the handwriting. Let's see the calligraphy it had to work with. Oh, the app is cool. Decent. And look, and remember, let's never forget, it is still just a Google Sheet. So let's go tools. Let's do some formatting, additional formatting. You get you get the idea. We'll make it we'll make it pretty. Do one, make sure it's negative. Do the positive, make it green, and boom. You've got yourself a full end-to-end -end going from analog feedback cards into structured data, all in a Google Sheet. All scalable. It's a sheet, so it's a form. So you can share it. You can share it with a group, share it with people, share it with your family. You can share it with anyone. Um, that is that. That is it. It's AppScript's really cool. Uh, if you've got free time and you haven't played around with AppScript, highly recommend it. Uh, there was all the demos. Here is the link. So if you want to explore more about AppScript, there's the developer link. And then the APIs that I showed, that's the Vision API and the Natural Language API. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Amazing open to any questions. Yeah, thanks, Zach. That was really cool. I mean, I think that was basically the, you know, opening presentation of DuckConf. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the next exactly. big thing, yeah. You know, only ducks. Or I guess you could reverse it and use it to make sure all the speakers are uploading pictures of people and not ducks and other animals. Yeah, the, 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 the possibilities. Uh, the utility is, is, yeah, it's endless. All the ducks. And, and yeah, and you know the whole tab tracking thing is always a a fun little <laughs> exercise in <laughs> finding your tab. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's the worst. Yeah, so so Gotta for those that. who are yeah. watching, um, you know, please come on and and ask questions in the Q and A. The the link is over up there, um, and in the live chat as well. Uh, we got we got one question here that came through while you were presenting, so I'll share that and, oh, yeah. and we can talk a little bit about that. So anonymous asks, how do you share a sheets demo with different people in your org and handle the shared state and permissions? Oh, that is excellent because I actually did this recently. Uh, so this, what's cool about this? So yeah, you can share it. Uh, this is with like a demo Gmail account. Uh, but you can specify groups. So there's a thing called Google Groups. And if you go to that, that is a way you can kind of group together email addresses. 
and then you the, it effectively it makes its own email address for that group and then you can just go through and add people to that google group and you can even set up that group so that people can add themselves which is what i use a lot and then yeah after you've got that google group and you've got loads of people added to it uh, you can just add that group's email here and it will share it with them and then you can specify things like um if they can just see it if they can edit it if they can comment on it another really cool thing that i just recently discovered about uh google sheets is that you can add conditional permissions so if i like highlight maybe i only want people to edit this bit uh, i can click on that and i can go do, do, do conditional format uh protect range i actually can't remember what i clicked on it sheet set permissions yeah so you can say okay uh i don't know users of the app be like for this range set permissions it'd be like okay everyone in a certain group can so you can add custom and stuff can it just edit this bit so it's the the sort of editing and the sharing ability in in google sheets goes from just like the whole sheet down to specific cells and things like that so that that's the way so yeah google groups and you've also got like more fine grain control in the um, conditional uh, permissions that's really cool and and just like in general how using sheets and other kind of google drive google docs g suite stuff kind of just takes away a lot of the complexity around um building apps and you know developers are nothing if not lazy so it's really perfect absolutely uh Preach, we got another yeah. question coming through from vimal he asks uh you know it says this is a very interesting use case uh, are there any limits i.e how many api calls can you make um, around these Ooh, api calls so yeah that's that's a good question so the api call quotas are specific for each api so if you go to say like the vision uh the vision link i've got there that will tell you the quotas and you can always um, apply for more quota so those apis that are on the google cloud they're they're kind of designed for heavy scale uh, in fact if you're using it as like a developer would like testing out stuff and maybe only making maybe a couple of hundred calls a month most of them are completely free uh, and so there's like virtually no limit for like hacking around and developing with uh, for app script specifically, the only, um, the only, uh, sort of limit I've run into is that app script can only handle 50 megabytes of data at a time. So I ran into this when I wanted to do video analysis within a Google sheet and I was uploading a video to Google drive and downloading that into the app script as it was running. And it ran into a limit of, okay, this file is greater than 50 megabytes. It can't work with it. And so I find that's a limit. And the way I got around that is because I was using the Google Cloud platform to do the actual video analysis with the video APIs and stuff, I actually used App Script to share the drive file with Google Cloud Platform's like service account, which is like an email address for Google Cloud Platform. And then I just got Google Cloud Platform to just download the file direct. So there's always ways working around it. The only limit I've run into is the 50 megabyte limit within app script, but there's always ways to kind of work around it. All the other APIs, they have their own specific limits, but most of these ones that I show are pretty big. Interesting that, um, the kind of, uh, whatchamacallit, the limit you're talking about is like kind of the memory space of the running application almost. Yeah. It's weird that, but yeah, I haven't seen any other, um, I haven't seen any quotas written. Um, maybe there is delved into, but the way. I mean, the way I typically use app scripts because it's dealing with like an individual file, I'm never really using an app script to scale to thousands of users. It's maybe just a team of like 10 people. So any quota that does exist is unlikely to be reached by normal app script use. Yeah, gotcha. So we got another question here from Victor uh, who says, who's asking about kind of how we connected the API results with the specific sheet. I think it's talking about mm -hmm. connecting the, um, not the API itself, right? The API results with that specific sheet. And I suspect that's from the script itself being created from that sheet, that script project. Oh, so like, how do you connect the app script itself to the Google I Sheets? I think that's what it's getting at. Victor, feel free to um, either clarify in the live chat or with more Q and A posts. Mm. But yeah, based on the reading of this, it says, um, didn't understand exactly how you connected the API results with the specific sheet. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that's that's talking about the actual, the actual connection from the app script to know, to talk to, to like put the data back into this Google sheet. And I, I completely understand, because I think I, I, I literally whizzed through that because it does happen, it's super seamless. Uh, and the only way to show it is to just kind of do it again, because it is so easy. 
uh, if, if you're in a Google sheet and you go to say like the tools script editor, that will automatically generate an app script project and connect it to that Google sheet. And that does it for me. I've never gone through the process of creating the app script first and then finding a Google sheet for it to run on. Uh, although I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do that as well. Cause that's under like the triggers and stuff. You can direct it at a specific Google sheet, but in this instance, I go into whatever G suite document I want to work with and I click script editor and it's just going to automatically generate the script for me and make that connection. So whenever inside that script, I run the command, get active sheets, it's going to know I'm talking about that specific sheet. So yeah, it's this crazy seamless sort of integration it has between app script and the rest of uh, G suite. I'm actually, uh, I'm curious, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it now. Like, cause here's all my sort of app script projects. I think this icon over here means it's connected to a Google sheet. I don't know if there's a way, if I go like new project, it's gonna let me, okay, this, so this is a blank one that isn't connected to anything. Um, I know that when I said get active uh, spreadsheet, you can specify the ID of the spreadsheet and connect it directly to that one. Uh, I am not sure if there's I'm sure, I'm sure there's a way of doing it the other way, going from the project to the sheet, but standard use case is to start with your, whatever Google sheet you're working in and go look at the tools edit script. Awesome. And, and so yeah. we, we have just put maybe one more question. Folks really enjoyed this demo by the way, Zach, um, you know, people oh, are wondering, you know, where, much. where you get your ideas from and, and the thinking process <laughs> is very interesting. Um, Anil <laughs> wants to know, uh, if there's some kind of step-by-step, -step, uh, guidelines or guides uh, that we have do, if you're going to write this up or perhaps we can point them to our process that's coming up on Friday. Oh, yeah. so yeah, we, so yeah, me, well, you can, you can tell me, you appreciate you got more detail. <laughs> well, Zach and I will be doing a full hour on this demo on Friday, this Friday um, at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, noon Pacific and um, same channel. So you can catch Kind of the details of that there and we're gonna really work through all the details i'm i'm really excited to see what zach has in store for me and um you know you can get your kind of detailed questions answered there you can kind of help direct us of like oh what's this do and we will mess around with it and we'll see um see if yeah. you can we'll break, break it. it we'll break it down <laughs> yeah. a little bit. Uh, uh there's also uh i i noticed because in the app script if we go to this link this uh google app script uh, I was looking around. I was like, "Oh, this is this is interesting." Because I never actually look directly at yeah. this page. I'm always I always like search app script like Google Sheets. It takes me directly to the Google Sheets uh, relevant stuff. But if I click on if it's samples and then G Suite Solution Gallery, it might be a bit small there. But if I go to G Suite Solution Gallery, I was just I was just casually scrolling through this, and then I I just saw this <laughs> literally what I came up with yesterday. They've already got like a full wow. thing on. Doing so, so you so. didn't see this before thought, you wrote I, yours. No. That's amazing. No, no, no. I swear, I know. <laughs> but I guess it, it seems like a, a natural thing to just connect the APIs yeah. together. But yeah, this is also loads of other really good examples of of connecting things together and like leveraging things like the Google Cloud Platform with with the G Suite. This looks really neat. Um, and and the kind of I guess sort of related question, uh, Bimal asks if it's possible to create a single sheet or perhaps a single script with a library of functions that you can then use and call from other sheets or other scripts inside of the sheets. Um, kind of like a library. I noticed you had a auth.js uh, file side by side Ooh, yeah, where you, you were hiding that, your code. Yeah. I was curious how you imported that. That was going to be my question. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. A great question. Like how do you like maybe work with libraries and maybe you've got like a, a nice file that you like to work with. Uh, in this it's, I go like file script file give it a name, blah, 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 dot GS is, I guess, the yeah. name convention. Go Google script. And right there, you're working with it. Yeah, Google yeah. script, yeah. And, so and right there, you're working, working with it. Is it global in terms of how you can work, you know, across uh, files? Huh. Yeah, that is, I think it automatically is imported that in and it's visible to everything else. So literally, so I won't show my auth, my auth script, but what, what's inside my auth script is, that I, oh, I'm so, I was so close to clicking on it. <laughs> Is it, it's not a big deal. It just means I have to recreate an API yeah. key. And I, I saw that in your code where you appended the API key and I was yeah. um, wondering where that was declared. It literally looks like that. Like that's my auth script. So I didn't need to make an import or if you work with like Node.js, you see you have to like create import things. Like not nah, just, just, just plop it there and it's visible to everything that's else. Great. Yeah, I was wondering about that when you were scrolling up and down the main file. I was like, where's his import statement? <laughs> 
Yeah, no, no imports. Even like, okay, so the closest thing you have to import, so this is already, drive.app is already imported. Most of all the basic, like, fundamental G Suite stuff is already there for you to use. The only extra things that I've done, there's like, I think it's libraries. You can, um, one of the things that I connect into this is like OAuth uh, for doing stuff like maybe you give someone's permission to change their file, but you're actually logged in. But yeah, there's some crazy files to work with. And um, like if you're working with uh, service mm -hmm. accounts, that's a bit trickier. Uh, and then there's a library specifically and you type in, it's kind of kind of weird. You would think you would just search like service account libraries. Like, nope, <laughs> uh, there, is a, there is a page somewhere that specifies all the libraries that you can possibly right. import. And from there, you type in an ID that looks oh, like that. <laughs> wow. And you get the ID yeah. <laughs> and then import it like that. That's rather abrupt. So there's, yeah. there's a way to import <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the one thing which I think AppScript could be a bit more intuitive mm -hmm. with. But other than that, it's a it's really sweet, uh, sweet, sweet, sweet of tools. Yes. Sweet, 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 sweet. <laughs> All right, is. we have one final question and then we'll move on to our final presenter. Oh. Uh, whether or not you can have kind of one script writing to multiple docs, right? Meaning you can trigger to do work on more than one sheet at a time. Oh. Um, absolutely, because you can specify the sheet in the ID of like, or I say like get active sheet, which is like a quick way of just getting the current uh, sheet. Uh, there, you can replace that, I believe, like get sheet by ID, and then you're changing a, a, a spreadsheet that's somewhere else. And what I'd also like to say, I've also, one of my internal sort of pet projects at Google, uh, I was building something that actually generated documents using app script. So not only was it changing a document, but it was generating the document from scratch and filling it out with things like it was, it was generating a Google doc and filling out like tables and images and even inserting nice. GIFs. Um, it's crazy. You can do anything with the, with app script and you can even generate documents yeah. and then like keep those documents as a reference if you store them somewhere. But yeah, you can interact with, with other sheets just by specifying get cheap by ID and then you pass in the ID and you've got it. Very cool. All right. So, at this point, let's move on to our uh, third presenter. We'll welcome uh, Dale Markowitz on and, and oh. let her start um, presenting. So oh. How are you doing, Dale? Dale's got, uh, oh, <laughs> she clicked present rather than um, join, so so we'll have her sort that out. Oh, I'll just stay here a bit then. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep chatting about ducks and, and geese. And when you did that and it came up as goose, I was like, ha, huh, duck, duck, goose. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's see. There nice. we go. Hey, Zach, I really liked your talk. Thanks. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't plan to speak about natural language, but it just sort of happened. <laughs> uh, I, I really connected with what you showed because um, Zach and I, we often are the people that get a new technology before a lot of people have used it and just need to build a proof of concept. And like you were saying, it is a huge pain in the ass to Sorry, I don't think you're supposed to say that on Google Cloud. Uh, <laughs> it is hugely annoying to build a front end just to, to do a very simple uh, proof of concept. So yeah, I use Apps Script the same way as you. I think it's awesome. I really like the demo. I like the live debugging too. Right. Well, it was all thanks to you, fine. <laughs> <laughs> all thanks to yeah, the Apps Script. I wanted to join too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let, I'll, I'll let you get on with your talk. So I'll see everyone else at the panel. That's at the right. End. Thanks, see you back. Bye. So uh, Zach just showed um, a great way to build a proof of concept of machine learning apps using App Script because, like I said, it allows you to not have to worry about uh, building a whole complicated front end. Um, but conveniently, I'm going to show you another um, another architecture that me and Zach I both use. I know because I've seen his code to also quickly build prototypes in Google Cloud, but using uh, Google Cloud Storage and Functions. So I guess I'll do that. Let me share my screen. Great. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about shining a light on dark documents. Uh, but first, what is machine learning useful for? Well, conveniently, you just saw two talks that spoke about exactly this topic, like building chatbots and matching intents uh, and analyzing sentiment and tagging photos. So you probably have a good idea and also, if you follow tech news, you've probably heard a lot of the more glamorous machine learning use cases like piloting self-driving cars or enabling something like the Google Assistant or most recently trying to predict uh, what drugs are good candidates to treat people with COVID or tracking the spread of COVID. So you probably know about a lot of the flashy use cases of machine learning, but what are most enterprises actually doing with this tool? Well, one of the most uh, 
common machine learning use case. This is much simpler. It's just making data easier to work with. A little less glamorous, but, su but super useful. So what do I mean by that? Well, tons of business data is this so-called dark data. What is dark data? Uh, it's data that you collect, but you don't use. You pay to hold on to it, but you don't actually get any insight out of it. Uh, and according to one recent study uh, at a lot of businesses, only 14% of data is critical useful. 32% is useless, meaning it's outdated, it's wrong, it's redundant with other data that you're paying to store. And then 54% of data is dark, meaning you're holding on to it, but you're not doing a whole lot with it. Why would you hold on to data that you're not doing anything with? Well, it could be because of compliance. Maybe you collected a, a waiver that users signed, but you don't do anything with it until you know you, you need to show it because you get into it to a legal situation. Um, but even more commonly, uh, you're, you're paying to store all of this data, and it's just you think it will be useful one day, but just not today because it's too difficult to deal with. Why is it difficult to deal with? Because it's in a format that's not easy for data scientists and engineers to play with. So what is a data format that's easy to work with? I would say any data that's tabular in a spreadsheet or in a database. Uh, so if I can write a query against a database, oh, let me get rid of my chat window. If I can write a query against a database and say, show me all the users that their join date, the comments that they wrote on the forum, then that's very easy to use. It's very easy to analyze and use in applications. Um, but something like unstructured text, uh, text in emails or newspaper articles. It's just this sort of long paragraphs of text. Uh, you can do a word search against it. You can do a keyword search, um, but it's not the most easily uh, easy data, site to, data source to extract insight from. Even more challenging maybe are structured documents. So I'm talking about PDFs where instead of just a long um, paragraph of you know talking about the news, you actually have a form where you want to associate, okay, this is the person's name that they wrote on the form, and this is their date of birth. If you had this in a Google form, it'd be very easy to work with, but a lot of businesses instead have uh, PDFs, either digital or literally have handwriting on documents. Uh, this is even more difficult to work with. And then images also particularly difficult to sort through because, you know, in many cases, there, you don't have the right metadata. You want to know what's in a picture. Zach actually just did a great job of showing how machine learning can help with this because he uploaded a photo to that Google form. And you saw the Vision API tag the image with what was in it. And then it's in a sheet. So OK, great. Now it's instantly much easier to th sort through uh, photos. So this is exactly how machine learning can help take an annoying data type and turn it into an easily searchable and queryable data type. And today, I'm going to talk about how to do that at scale for a specific data, data type, which is documents. Why? Because they're just so common in business. And by documents, I'm talking about emails, waivers, uh, contracts, legal forms, IDs like passport or driver's license, usually in the form of a text file, a PDF, uh, and it's possible like a TIFF or some other image format. And what I'm going to show you how to build today is a pipeline that, that at a high simple level, it looks at all your documents, sees what it has to work with, understands it using some machine learning algorithm, and then makes it useful by putting those insights it extracts into a queryable BigQuery database. BigQuery is Google's fast and highly scalable database. OK, so step one, what we'll build is something that sorts documents. Um, so for example, uh, here are a bunch of different document types, forms, articles, resumes, invoices. They're, they all happen to be images in this case. Um, we're going to build a document sorter that takes uh, an image or a PDF of a document and then labels it as an invoice, article, or resume. The reason that you would want to do this is, OK, let me give you a use case. I recently um, applied to rent an apartment. And usually when you do that, you have to go into your renter's portal and you have to upload your tax returns and uh, your bank statements and all of this, th these different document types, right? So this uh, document sorter that we'll build could be something that you place behind, if you're, if you're building this rental portal, that you place behind that upload that says, oh, this is the bank statement. Oh, this is the tax return and so on. So that'll be step one. We have a bunch of different do document types and we want to figure out, well, what document type is this? Next, once we know what we're working with, we want to understand it, which means different things for different types of documents. For an article, for some unstructured text, or maybe it's an email or a report, we want to apply tags. Is this an article about sports or medicine or politics? What, what, what's an appropriate tag that I want to search by? 
for something like an invoice, we want to extract uh, very specific types of fields, right? Who sent the invoice? When did they send it? What's the invoice ID? What were the items? What were the prices? Uh, if we have a form, right, this is a sort of like a more generalized invoice. We want to we want to identify, well, what are the different forms on the field and what are the values that the person wrote or typed in? And finally, uh, we'll look at a, a very custom data type, which is a resume. So we have a very you know, specific idea of what fields we want to extract from a resume, probably a person's name, maybe where they went to school. Um, so I'll show you how to do that as well. And finally, once we have analyzed all those data types, like I said, we'll put the data into BigQuery. So this is what I'm going to show you how to build a document processing pipeline. I'm sorry, I know this is really small, but don't worry, we'll go through it step by step. But the idea is we'll upload all of our data into something called Google Cloud Storage. If you're a Google Cloud developer, you've probably used this before. It's basically a big bucket or folder to store any data type. Then we'll use uploading a file to trigger this pipeline where the document gets sorted, then moved into a new folder depending on its file type. So sort the invoices from the forms, from the articles. Um, then we will analyze them and store the data in BigQuery. Okay, so step number one, sorting documents. To do this, we'll need to use this very, very common natural language processing technique called text classification. This is using machine learning to build a model that takes a block of text and slaps a label on it. So in our case, the label will be invoice, uh, article, and so on. Um, but this is a more general technique that can be used for lots of different things. For example, you can build a text classifier that takes the body of an email and labels it as spam or ham or not spam. Uh, you could use it to look at the review of a new movie and decide what genre uh, it should be classified as. Or as Lee talked about earlier, you could use this technique to do something called intent matching. So this is if you're building a chatbot and your user says, I want to make a reservation, and you have to connect what they said to what intent they want and then return with the appropriate response. Uh, when would you like to make your reservation? And of course, our task is to identify article types. So uh, in this sort of pipeline, if you're going to build a text classification model, so first I'll say this is a really common machine learning task for which you'll find many tutorials if you Google, and there are many ways to do it. But the first step will be to make sure that you have text you're working with. So if you have a PDF or an image file, you'll need to extract the text. This is called OCR, or Optical Character Recognition. There are many tools that will do it for you. We offer one in the uh, Document AI API and in the Vision API. Uh, this will extract text, not just from PDFs, but also from uh, images, like if there's text on a street sign. But there are also, I mean, other cloud providers offer similar tools, and there are also open source alternatives. So step one is take your documents and extract all of the text. Next, you need to train a model that identifies what type of thing the text is. And I'll give you two different approaches for this. So first is to train your own model using your own data. I'll call this a custom model trained from scratch. And the other one is to find an existing model. So uh, I assume many of you are software developers on this call. Uh, and you probably think uh, if you encounter a really difficult task like um, doing encryption, you're like, OK, this is complicated, but I'm sure a lot of other people need to do this. And there must be a good library for it. Well, the same thing applies to machine learning. Uh, if you're doing a very common task, you can often find an API or a model that already does the thing that you need to do uh, without you having to provide any data. More on that in a second. Right now, we're going to train our own model using custom data. Uh, like I said, because this is so common of a task, there are many different tutorials and frameworks for allowing you to build a text classification model. Uh, I've listed a few icons on the screen. One that comes to mind is Spacey. This is a really popular Python toolkit for natural language processing. If you want to build a deep uh, neural network and really get into the weeds, you could try something like TensorFlow or PyTorch. But today, we're going to use a tool called Google AutoML Natural Language, which is a no-code way to build a model. And in fact, you can do it completely in a GUI in the cloud console. I'm going to choose this way because it's sort of like the fastest uh, way to get a model started, if, especially if you don't know anything about machine learning. All right. Uh, so the way that this tool works is that you bring your own data set. So I have this large data set of different documents. I'll show you it in a second. And they've been labeled by human beings already. So I have lots of different documents that have been labeled. AutoML will train a custom model for me, and then it will host it, and I can call it like any other REST endpoint. So let me show you. So this tool is called AutoML Text and Document Classification. It's called Text and Document because it supports both raw text, but also PDFs. So if I click Get Started, I will show you this data set that I already uploaded. Uh, it's an open source data set. It's actually in the slides. I'll share it with you later. 
And this data set contains about 4,000 document types and includes articles. Let me make this a little larger. It includes articles, budget, email, form, and invoices. And here are the different documents. So I'll show you a budget. This actually is a PDF. And what AutoML did was it actually took the PDF. This is the original PDF. It took it and it twisted it and it extracted all of the text for you. So you don't need to do that OCR step I mentioned earlier. And then here's the label that have been annotated by humans. Because the way that machine learning works usually is that you provide a data set that's been annotated by humans and then you train a model to figure out what the pattern is and then be able to automatically label new documents. So once you've uploaded your label data set, you can train a custom model by going to the train tab, click start training, name your model. Uh, this normally takes a couple of hours, so I won't train one in front of you right now, but I will show you a model that I already trained. Um, it gives you different metrics to evaluate the quality, like precision and recall. These are two metrics that data scientists use a lot to evaluate mo model quality, and I can tell you that 90% is pretty good for both of these metrics. And finally, you can test and use your model right here in the UI. Um, in fact, the way I'll test it is I'll pass it. Um, see, I'll pass it an article. Let's see if it can recognize. This is a New York Times article that I've taken a picture of. Let's see. Oh, wait. No, sorry. It wants a PDF. Um, hmm, do I have some PDFs here? Okay, <laughs> I guess I won't be able to test this for you right now because I don't have a good PDF in cloud storage to test it out with. Um, but you can pass a path to a PDF and click predict and it will tell you what the, it thinks the document is. <laughs> uh, but of course you don't actually wanna just use the UI to do, uh, to make predictions. You really wanna make predictions in code. So you would do that with a REST endpoint or using a client library like, and here's a code sample to show you how to use it in Python. Um, but you can also, of course, use Node or Go or Java or whatever your language of choice is. So this is our model, and I've actually deployed it so it's being hosted in the cloud, and I'm going to use it as the first step in our document processing pipeline. So let's go back here. Okay, so we've used AutoML to both convert our PDFs to text and to classify them as documents, and then we'll predict the labels, article, invoice, and so on. And what I'm going to use this to do in the pipeline is to I'll upload a file to Google Cloud Storage. Then that will trigger what's called a cloud function that will use the model I just showed you to predict what type of document we have and then to move that to a new bucket. And if that sounds abstract, I'll show you in a second. But first, real fast, if you've never heard of a cloud function, um, it's a very popular tool to quickly prototype stuff on GCP. It allows you to run a function in Python or Node or Go without um, allocating a whole virtual machine or server, you can just say, I want you to run this Python function when something happens, like when somebody makes an HTTP request or someone uploads a file. So let me just show you what this looks like. So here I am in the Google Cloud storage browser. Here are all my buckets. Like I said, this is sort of like a folder. And I have this one folder documents in, it's empty right now. And the way I'm going to design this is that I'll upload a file in fact, I'll upload right now a, um, an article. I'll upload this article about Medicaid. And I'll actually show you what that article looks like. It's just this uh, snapshot I got from the New York Times. Um, and the way that I've designed this is that uploading a file actually triggers a function to run. I'll show you that in a second. But if I refresh this bucket, oh, the file's gone. Why? It was moved by this cloud function. More on that in a second. OK, so that's the storage part. Now. In Google Cloud, there's this concept of functions. So like I said, it's a sort of serverless way to run code. So you would go into this, it's, you find Google Cloud functions right here in the left-hand panel. You go here, you click create new function. Okay, so you'll name your function something like analyze document. And then you get to pick a trigger. What causes this function to run? Um, an HTTP trigger allows you to basically make a web server where you can run get or post requests, right? But in this case, we're going to do something simpler. Uh, we're going to have this function run whenever I upload a file to cloud storage. And in particular, whenever I put it into this documents in bucket. So that's how that function ran as soon as I uploaded a file. And then you can actually type the code that you want. To, you can type the code that you want to run right into this file right here. In fact, I'm using Python. Now my code's a little bit long, so I didn't do it in this editor. I actually did it in VS Code. 
But to show you what that looks like, I wrote this function sort documents in Python. Now, when this cloud function runs, it passes uh, data and a context, and that contains the name of the bucket, where was the up file uploaded, and what was the name of the file that was uploaded. So I use this information to get the document, to classify it by type, and then what I do is I actually move it to a new bucket. So if it finds it form, the file goes to the forms bucket. If it finds an article, the file goes to the articles bucket. Um, and you can actually see if we go back here, if I go into the articles bucket, that article I just uploaded has been moved here. Uh, so how did the uh, how did that cloud function know what type of document it was looking at? Well, it used that model that I just showed you that we trained, and that's done in this classify document function. I'm not going to walk you through this uh, in detail, but basically, uh, the way that you call this model in code is you import a prediction service client and you pass the location of the model, and then to make a prediction, you say prediction client dot predict. Um, the model name and then the payload. The payload contains a path to your file in cloud storage. Uh, and by the way, don't worry about understanding every bit of code here because uh, the code is both open sourced and uh, there will be a blog post walking through it in depth shortly. Okay, so we've just used a cloud function to sort our document into a new bucket where it belongs. And I just showed you how to do it. Okay. Now, what I just showed you was me uploading a, an article and the article was recognized and moved to the articles bucket. Now, the type of analysis that we want to do for this unstructured data, right, it's just a long paragraphs about a different topic, is we want to tag it. Um, so here are, for example, a bunch of New York Times articles. We want to be able to apply tags, computer electronics, arts, and entertainment. This way, if I want to search, give me all of the computer, the, the technology articles in my database, it's very easy. Now, I mentioned before that when you want to classify documents or text, you can either build your own model or find one that exists that does it for you. And we're going to take that approach this time um, because tagging articles, what topic are they talking about? It's such a common task that we can actually find pretty good pre-trained models to do it for us. And the one, that I'm, the one that I'm using in this case is the Google Natural Language API. This is a Google Cloud API that does a lot of operations on text, including uh, detecting sentiment. That means, is the text saying something positive or negative? I hate flying on airplanes, right? That's a negative sentiment. That's one thing it does. It can detect topics, which is what we want to do now. Is this an article about computers or medicine? It can uh, analyze the syntax of sentences and also identify entities like people's names and places and phone numbers. So now what I've done is, I just showed you how uploading a file to the documents in bucket causes it to trigger the sorting function. Well, when a file is moved to the articles bucket, it triggers a second cloud function. And that second cloud function calls the Google Natural Language API, which writes tags to a database. I'll show you the code. It's in this tag articles file. So when a new file comes into the articles bucket, um, this function calls, let's see, where's the file here? Get tags. Get tags takes a block of text, and then it uses the natural language API. This is all the code for using the natural language API. It gets a client, it passes the text. You can do it plain text or a PDF, and then you call classify text. This spits out a bunch of different tags, and then writes them to the database. Ah. I've had those tags written to this big query table, articles tag. So let me query this table, see if the tags were extracted. And there is the article. And the API identified this article is about politics, health insurance, government, and health news, which seems about right to me. OK. So we analyze unstructured documents like articles. But what about structured documents like invoices, driver's license, contracts, waivers? These are documents where the actual layout of the document has some meaning. You can't just extract the text and ignore the layout. It won't be meaningful. 
So what if we want to uh, analyze a form? Like I said, where the form fields, like it's date, colon, line, and then the answer. And you want a model that doesn't just look at the text, it actually understands that this is a form and um, returns the JSON appropriate, it returns the data as something like JSON with this structure intact. For this, I'll use a brand new tool called Document AI API. Disclaimer, this is what I work on when I'm not uh, getting uh, live streams, which is a tool set for doing all sorts of things related to documents. In fact, a lot of things I just showed you, they're actually part of Document AI. And one of the newest features that we just released is an API for parsing structured documents. Let me show you. So anybody can go to this page. It's cloud.google.com slash solution slash document AI. And on this page, there's a little demo that shows off how to use this API. So first I'll upload a form. I'll upload this form. Do I have it opened? It's just this, this fake health intake form that I filled out as Sally Walker. So what this API does is it looks at the form and it identifies all of these different form fields and their associated value. And as you can see, it not only understands the keys and values, but it also uh, tells you where on the document they're located. So you can draw cute little bounding boxes like this. I'm going to have to zoom out a bit. Um, in addition to understanding form fields, it also identifies tables. There's actually not a new table on this. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, and it just does OCR text extraction. Um, so you can upload any form and it does a pretty good job of identifying the keys and values and fields. Um, there's also a feature specifically for invoices. This is unfortunately in private beta, but it will be not in private beta very soon. And this is a model that Google has trained on lots of invoice data that is particularly good at understanding the types of fields that you care about there. So I just uploaded an invoice. Do I have it here? No. This is what it looks like. And as you can see, this API looks for things like invoice number, date, the sender and receiver, and it understands these relationships between line items, what's their price, what's the quantity, and what's the total. So for the next part in this pipeline, I'm going to upload a form and I want it to uh, extract instead of tags, like the first one, I want it to extract form fields. So I will do that now. I'll go back to the documents in bucket. This time I'll upload a form, which is my health intake form. When I upload it, it triggers that first cloud function that sorts it. So now it should be in the forms bucket. Let's check. Yep, there it is. And the form field should also be written to BigQuery. So I will, <laughs> this is so small, sorry. We'll query this forms table. Let's see everything that's in the forms table. And ah, it's that form that I just uploaded. It recognized date of birth, city, um, zip code. And now I can have my forms instantly digitized. All right, so we just uh, extracted tags from unstructured text. We analyzed a structured document like a form, but we could have done an invoice or something with tables. But now let's say you have a really custom document type for which no pre-trained model exists, right? We just talked about this earlier, whether you can uh, use a pre-trained model or you, should, or you have to train your own using your own custom data. So let's say that I want to analyze resumes. Uh, there is no, that I know of, there is no pre-trained resume parsing model. And I want to design my own model because I have specific fields I want to look for. I want to be able to identify people's names, their phone numbers, their emails, where do they go to school, what was their GPA? This isn't my real resume. I'm not Dale Snail. Where, uh, where do they work and what was their job history? So I'm going to show you how you can train a custom model using Google Cloud to uh, analyze your own unique document types. And I'm actually going to use this using this, the same tool I showed you before, AutoML Natural Language, um, but a slightly different feature. So. Okay, so I showed you a text and document classification model before. Again, this is slapping label on a document or a block of text, but now I don't care about labeling an entire document. I actually care about labeling different segments within a document. And for that, I'll use AutoML entity extraction. 
Now, what I've done is I actually generated a bunch of fake resumes and I also found a lot of uh, open source data sets of resumes and I uploaded them into this tool. And then I manually went in so and I labeled all this data for various fields. So in this tool, you can uh, upload PDFs, which is what I did. This is what PDF looked like. The tool automatically extracts the text from the PDF. And then to train my model, I needed to, as a human being, label the data for what I wanted. So I went in and I actually like clicked and dragged and said, ah, okay, this is a, a skill or a phone number or a GPA, or whatever. So that's how I created this data set. To train a model, it's exactly the way I showed you before. You go into this claim, train tab, click start training. I will not go into this in depth because I just showed it to you before. Um, but this is exactly, this is how you train a model, just like we did the other classification model, but instead of slapping a label on a whole document, it's going to actually annotate, okay, pull out the person's name, pull out their GPA, pull out their email and so on. And with that, we've covered every piece of the document processing pipeline on structured text documents, structured text documents, and even custom structured text documents and put all the data into a BigQuery database. Um, you can do this all yourself because the code is open source and on GitHub. It's right here, Dale Quirk slash document pipeline. I'm also very close to being done with the blog post that describes this in detail. If you want it to be walked through in even more depth than this talk, um, it will be on my blog, dalenai.com. And that's all I got for now. You there, Yifeng? Yep. Thanks so much, Dale. That was really, really interesting. And let's see. Let's try to see if we can find some questions. I'm really curious what, um, Kind of how long did this all take to build right like that was a lot of different components to put together i'm sure it was kind of a process as you added pieces to this workflow um but yeah yeah so this workflow i kind of mentioned this when i was talking talking about zach mm -hmm. so the idea that you upload a file to cloud storage and then you use a cloud function to call a machine learning api and you put data in bigquery it's one that i use all the time and it, it's one that a lot of people use um because um, and sort of handles a lot of the glue for you. So um, there's, it, it took me a while to debug, you know, certain things. Why is, why is there not permission here? Or what's, why am I getting these weird results? Am I parsing the JSON wrong? Um, but because the architecture is just so familiar and I use it all the time, it really didn't take that long. Great, yeah, no, that's really cool. And I guess the only really time consuming thing it sounds like was the, all that manual labeling of resumes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there actually is a service now that uh, it, within Google where you send out data and you specify how you want it to be labeled. And they could have done my resumes for me. But when I built that particular demo, it didn't uh, exist yet. So I was first doing it fair myself. Fair enough. Uh, and reminder to, to the viewers out there, you know, we do have a live Q&A uh, in that link that's, that's there in the, which side? Over there. And um, as well as in the YouTube live chat. So feel free to let us know about you know, what, use ca what use cases you have in mind, um, what you think might be possible with kind of document AI and how you can connect it with different parts of GCP and I guess potentially also G Suite stuff. Yeah, actually, now that I have you yeah, here, you thing, since Zach talked about how he quickly builds demos and Lee showed how she builds a demo and I showed how I build a demo, how do you quickly how build demos? How do I demos? quickly build demos? I don't know if my demos are, are quickly built, but I definitely use that um, format of uploading files and triggering cloud functions. I, that's been good. Uh, one thing I've been recently playing around with is Cloud Run. Um, getting kind of the basics of Kubernetes and Docker and stuff and has really revealed to me the the actual work you need to go from uh, just using App Engine or just using Cloud Functions to being something a little bit more flexible. That actual work is not that much, and it's like once you get a few commands down, you I have like I feel like at least a working kind of debugging um, ability to to like take care of like just see the error at least because there was a there was a phase at the beginning where i literally couldn't even tell like oh it broke i don't know why uh, <laughs> and so um ah while we're talking a a question has appeared so let's let's take a look at that and um prashant asks what happens when two forms with the same name are uploaded uh simultaneously what happens in that cloud function do you have anything in there to dedupe or handle the case yeah that's a really good question so no i don't have anything in there to do 
Um, there's no, so the problems would be that there's a stage in the pipeline where you move a file from input to output, uh, from one bucket mm -hmm. to another. So if you had two, bucket, uh, two files with the same name in the same bucket, yeah, one would overwrite the other and that would be bad. But there's a simple solution to this, which is that really when files are going into the first bucket, you should just rename them to some random, random string. Ah. And then you can save the file name and write it to BigQuery. Um, but I, honestly, this problem comes up constantly. Like, like if a user uploads a file to an app that you're building, you don't want to save their file name because what if they upload the same, exactly what was just said, file with the same name. So you really always want your file names to be some like randomly generated string. Yeah, that's, that's a good tip. And then thanks to Prashant for asking that question. Um, let's see, I think, I don't know if I have any other questions I jotted down here. I mean, just the, the workflow is really interesting, right? Going from a document, uploading to cloud storage, running to cloud functions, running into document AI, putting it into BigQuery. Like there's, so, there's so many pieces to kind of string together and keep track of all those different Python scripts and getting them pushed to the right spots in GCP and, and writing all yeah, this. I guess, yeah, I think, <laughs> because um, I've done so many projects this way. In the beginning, it was kind of a nightmare because it can be kind of difficult to debug cloud functions, which I think maybe is why you're moving to cloud run. Um, the trick being, you just want to make as many tests as possible that wrap the functions before you actually yeah, deploy Yeah, run them. local. Yes, yeah. yes. That's and we're having uh, some of our panelists are joining in now. And mm -hmm. there's Zach. So, so we are complete, as it were. Uh, all four of our, our panelists. Great to have you all back on, Lee and Zach. Thank you, Dave, thanks for joining us. No worries. Um, and yeah, so folks, you should continue to ask questions in the Q&A or on the live chat. Uh, at this point, I'll kind of hand it off to, to Dave to help moderate Great. this a little bit and uh, spur conversation. Thank you, Fang. So um, thank you all for fantastic presentations. Um, that was exciting. The um, so a few questions popped up that I had and some of the viewers had, and I'm just going to go across and uh, address these questions to each of you and feel free to interject uh, as you see fit uh, with these questions. So let me start uh, with you, Lee. Uh, the sure. the obvious question or the the most I guess prominent question is for conversational AI. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what um, what developers should be thinking about in the world of COVID-19 and social distancing? So what's happening with you know, chatbots and, and the like? Yeah. So as bad as the coronavirus is, I mean, we are seeing a lot of good stuff when it comes down to conversational AI. And uh, one thing I addressed during my presentation, uh, that's like when you look at IoT devices, like at the train station or at an airport, uh, like those like devices, like a screen or a, or a pin pad or a keyboard, you don't want to touch it anymore. Like you could use voice for that. That's a great use case. Um, the other big use case, which is even bigger, is like in the complex centers. Uh, think about airports. Like they like now with the, the coronavirus, they have like waiting times of like 15 minutes more or more than an hour, or they cut you just off because there's just no... Yeah, they just can't handle that amount of load on, on the contact center. Uh, for this, having it is all automated, like robots in the contact center that pick up the phone and can help you with answering the question. I bet nine of the 10 questions are like, well, my flight is canceled, what now? You know, if they have like the robot answering that type of question for you, yeah, you can free that load and then have your employees, your the, the agents uh, help with questions that do matter and do require more time. So right, right. So so we've been sort of headed down this path with with chatbots and conversational AI and the ability to use natural language processing. But it sounds like maybe this has accelerated that process. Yeah, okay. definitely. So so that kind of leads me to a, a little more tactical question. Your demo was greatly. Uh, uh, I have to think that with the multiple API calls sort of going from the front end. Um, using dialogue flow and then going back to multi again multiple APIs for speech to text, text to speech, things like that. What's the latency? What kind of latency should people expect? In yeah, that? I mean, like I can't say real numbers, but technically there should be a little bit of latency by calling so many different APIs. Like what what I did, like I had like I'm using three different APIs, and uh, and some I was using like twice. Um, so there must be some latency, but the thing is like all the APIs that I'm using are Google Cloud APIs, which are all on the same Google Cloud network. So that should be fast. 
um, the reason why there was some latency in my demo, why it was near real time, uh, that was because I was using a time slicer to collect just enough voice before sending it to dialect flow. But that's just a use case because you don't want dialect flow to detect uh, on just one or two words without uh, listening to the whole sentence. If I would build a, a transcript application that, that transcribes my voice, yeah, then I can do it on the letter if I want to. Then it could be like exactly real time. I don't think uh, the latency uh, of, of calling the APIs will be, will be, will be that much. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's actually a good a good segue to another sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, stream of thinking I had uh, for Zach, which was you, you know Zach, you showed a couple of those APIs uh, in your in your demos. Um, is there what what are the limits on the APIs you can call? And maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the other um, uh, Google Cloud APIs that uh, you might be able to call using in forms and sheets and 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 um, and uh, such. Yeah. Uh, so the limits around like the, um, there's, there's a limit. I think it's all in the, if you go to the, I think it's cloud.google.com forward slash vision, you can see the limits for the vision API and they break them down pretty well on the page. Like they show a table of here's the number of quotas you can call. Uh, I think I'm not sure the, like it, it what's crazy is like the, the default is pretty high. It's like in the, I don't know. I think it's, if I'm remembering one of my projects, uh, so don't quote me on this, but I believe it was like, I don't know, a hundred calls a minute. I think not for the video intelligence API. Well, uh, and, so and, not... but there's, but there's no, um, there's no, uh, reason that you couldn't use translate for instance, right. I, I, any of these other, um, uh, Google cloud ML APIs, right. Sorry. What was that? You, is, there's no reason you couldn't use other, uh, APIs. You could use translate for instance, right. Some of the oh, things yeah, yeah. Like you can use with. you can use all the APIs and all the quotas are like soft quotas, like literally in the Google Cloud console, you can just click a button and say apply for more quota. And yeah, I think the quotas are there just in case you accidentally maybe run a for loop with no delay in it and you call the API like a thousand times in a second. I think that's the only reason. Uh, so you can apply for quota, more quota uh, as you need it. Uh, so there's virtually I haven't experienced any actual hard cap on the um, on the quota and the quota is usually explained in like a per second or per minute. Uh, and what's also neat to know is all of the APIs I showed with the natural language and the and the image API, they have a batch call option. So if you do want to analyze, say, 10 images, 100 images at a time, uh, you can do that with one API call. So it's it's cool. Like everything's kind of built to scale and built for built for batches. So yeah, that's also one thing to look out for because if you've got like say images all stored in Google Drive and you want to get them all analyzed in the same way, rather than do what I did where I like clicked on one and analyzed it. You can write some script that will click on 10 and then send it all as one request and you'll get back all the different annotations for the individual images. All right. That's probably a better, more practical use case anyways, right? It's, yeah. It's, the drag, the drag and drop feature. Yeah. <laughs> so, so actually that's a good, that's a good reminder. Uh, could you uh, give some details, either you or Yufeng on your upcoming session? And I think Yufeng said it was noon on Friday, Pacific time, three o'clock Eastern. Is there any information that you can share about how to register for it or how to track it down? Do we just uh, follow you on Twitter or what's 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 the details on that? I mean, yeah, I've I've, uh, I've tweeted about it. So if you go to at zachakiel dot com, but I'll also uh, get you find and say his. Sure. Um, basically, we we have a meetup group. You can um, join. I'll drop a link in the live chat below. Um, but yeah, we have a meetup group. It'll be on YouTube Live, just like this one is. Same channel. So if you can, if you want, you can just go to the channel or subscribe, and you'll be able to um, see that. You can click that set reminder button. You can get that notification uh, so that you can tune in. And as Dave said, it's uh, noon east, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, and I want to say it's 8 p.m. if you're in London. So thank you, Zach, for staying up late to to, to tell everybody and show us how to make that. Um, machine learning with forms. Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna be a fun session, especially just based on the, the, the minute pair programming that we just did in my session. I think it's gonna be great. We're gonna build like five apps. It's gonna be great. Basically. Awesome. And, and, and four of the five won't work the first time, but by the end, they'll all work. That's right. They're all gonna work. As soon as you find lasers eyes on them, it just immediately works. <laughs> very cool, very cool. And Dale, uh, awesome, awesome demo. I think one of the questions that, um, uh, maybe wasn't clear is what which of the products you were showing are 
alpha, which are beta, which are public, sort of, sort of maybe a summary of, of uh, which ones folks can go with play and play with right now, uh, they go experiment with right now, um, that would probably be useful. That is a totally valid question, um, especially because the document I tools I talk I was talking about, it's totally new and so many things are coming out so quickly, but everything that I showed you can play with right now, I don't think that anything is not um, generally available except for the invoice parser feature, which is in private beta. You have to apply for that one, um, but everything else you can play with right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So we only have a, a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to open it up uh, to each of our speakers and ask them if you had sort of one or two, just, well, let's keep it one, one key piece of advice, because the topic here was practical AI, one key piece of practical advice for our developer audiences um, to implement ML in what they're, what they're doing today, what would it be? So let me start with, well, who wants to start? One practical, the most important thing, the most practical thing for. I for can them. start. I can start based on the based on building stuff with speech, dialect flow, for example. Um, when you're building uh, an application like what I did, um, I would definitely enable auto speech adaptation, and that's a way how you can bias the machine learning model that it listens to what you want it to to hear. Um, as an example, in an airport demo. I could say, like, I want to eat pizza. Or I could say, I want to I wanna go to Ibiza. You know, like, how can I make sure that the, that the model doesn't understand I want to eat pizza versus I want to go to Ibiza? You know, and that is an example. Like, in dialect flow, it's just a matter of flipping a switch. And then it knows, based on my intents and my entities, like, mm, this is probably about Ibiza, not about pizza, uh, that it uh, listens it well. When you use... Uh, uh, speech to text APIs, then you can set it in the SDK. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, Zach, what do you think? Um, I mean, Put you on the spot. I've, I mean, I've got so many little bits of advice that aren't really advice. Uh, if you can use an if statement, use an if statement instead of machine learning. Um, what is the other good one? Is oh yeah, oh yeah. This is this is one I came up with. Okay. The the. <laughs> The, the best machine learning model is the one that you actually deploy. Mm. Ah, gets you mm. thinking. So like whichever one actually you can put in someone's hands, that's the one you should use. Not like go crazy and experiment with some, the latest model that just came out of some research paper. Whichever one actually works and can work in your application, that's the best one to use. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, that's all the non-advice I have. Yes, yeah, that was my, my four-day weekend right there. Coming out of the research paper, and Dale, what, what's your what's your one piece of advice? Um, what I see, I think the most tricky thing about machine learning is that there are lots of different technologies that people want to try out, um, and there are always some unknowns, like uh, how difficult is it going to be? Where am I going to get caught? I don't know, right? But I think with pro uh, projects that involve machine learning, there's this huge unknown, which is the quality of the model. If you're using a pre-trained model. Um, like to extract text from a document, um, then the, the most important thing is that you want to take your real data and try out a model as quickly as possible to get a benchmark on quality. Um, that's what you want to be able to do as quickly as possible. Now, you can get into this tricky situation where if you want to do something really custom, like train a model to parse resumes, uh, it might be the fact that you have to embark on collecting a lot of data or, tr or labeled training data, and then you're sort of you have a big thing that you have to do. You have to collect all of this data before you can get going. Uh, so your goal should be whatever shortcuts you can take to try to evaluate quality, do it as quickly as possible. Find an existing data set that's sort of close or use your small data set and see how it does because uh, that's going to tell you whether it's worth investing more time or, or better to bail out early. Yep, that's great advice. That's great advice. And, and actually, that would be my, my, my advice is a little bit riffing off of what, what Zach and, and Dale said, which is, yeah, you know, you, you hear a lot of people say, you know, think before you jump. And in this case, I say, jump before you think. Just do it. Just get your fingers on the keyboard. Everyone, everything that the things that people have shown on this uh, session are available. You can go out and play with them, experiment with them today, um, and that's the best way to get good at it. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Feng, now because we are out of time. What do you say? You sounds Feng? good. I think we um, just have one final question in the Q and A. Uh, this one's about AutoML. 
and it's an anonymous question about AutoML's uh, cost estimation. You know, it says that even the Quick Start data set costs about $12 uh, US to run the demo. And so is there an estimate, way, a good way to estimate how much it costs to create a model in AutoML? I don't know who wants to take that one. Yeah. Yeah, I can start and, and Zach can, or whoever can chime in if they want to say something. I would say that one of the more unfortunate things is that all of the different, so I showed you document AI and, and natural language AutoML, but there are many AutoMLs. There's one for dealing with videos, images, um, translation, and unfortunately they all have slightly different um, cost models. There's the cost for training the model, there's the cost for making predictions, there's the cost in some cases for hosting the model. Um, so it can be a little bit tricky and it really depends on which one you're talking about. Um, one thing that I really like about the vision AutoML is that you can actually specify how much you want to spend to train a model. And that equates to these node hours. So it's like a combination of how long and on how many machines in parallel. Um, so, you, so, and there's oftentimes a trade-off, like the longer that you train, the higher the quality, but not always, but at least then you can say, okay, I'm going to spend $30 training an image model. And uh, if it's, if it's good, I'll keep going. But if it's crappy, I'll, I'll just stop there. And I think it's great advice. I would also just throw out there, and I'm not sure exactly what the state of it is today, but the, Google does have an online price calculator where you can put in some expectations around uh, what you're going to run, how long you're going to run it, and it'll come back and spit out uh, what, what the expected cost would be to do that. And we can include the link on that Definitely. after this. And the yeah. you know, pricing calculator, they try to keep that one up to date. So hopefully that one will be suitable for any sort of large scale estimates and it'll roll in the cost of storage and any other you know, things you might be running. Mm -hmm. I also have a quick quick point on the, uh, on the vision or at least on the vision models. I think this applies to all the other AutoML models. There is a different pricing for if you need real time predictions versus if you're just okay with getting batch predictions. Mm. Uh, and I've built models where you, after you train the model, you can say to deploy the model to like one node or two nodes. That you should like do with caution because that uh, the pricing can get uh, quite large, quite fast, uh, because it's deploying on like dedicated accelerated hardware constantly around the clock. Uh, I one of my recent demos where I built, I did video intelligence or video analysis in a Google Sheet. I actually used the batch prediction option on the AutoML vision models. And they're incredible because what they do, rather than send predictions, you tell it, oh, do the predictions on these images in a Google bucket. And it will automatically say, spin up your model, run the predictions, and then turn down your model. And the predictions for a couple of hundred, couple of thousand images come in like under a couple of dollars. And so that's a really cool option to look into because then it's still like a kind of serverless app. It only spins up when it needs to. So yeah, look into the batch prediction versus real-time prediction and make that trade-off based on your use case. I'm sure we both learned this the hard way from having deployed the vision model a year ago. And uh, yeah. About it. yeah, we had like, got shocked when we like had demos and we were like, oh, did we, did we turn those demos off? And then, <laughs> but yeah, learned learn the hard way. Batch predictions for APIs are a great idea. So we should all look into that. Nice. Yeah, the the cost of running something constantly 24/7 is sometimes can be shocking if you're not, you know, used to running kind of a, a consistent service, that's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I want to I want to thank all our speakers. I want to thank Dave for moderating our little panel discussion. That was really nice. Um, great to hear from everybody and and see everybody, you know, even as we're all separated to to all be kind of together and as you heard, all of our presenters are I think I want to say everyone's in a different time zone potentially. Like literally nobody is in a shared time zone. So that's really cool that we were able to get everybody together from Europe all the way to the West Coast. Uh, so great to see you all. Great to see everyone on the live stream. Thank you all for your questions, your participation. And uh, you know, we have more live streams this week on Wednesday and Friday. I'll be speaking with uh, DA um, Dina about end-to-end -end testing using Cloud Build. And then of course on Friday with uh, Zach all about the forms and machine learning. So looking forward to seeing everybody um, in those live streams, in the live chat. And yeah, I guess with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. I'll let everybody say goodbye. We can all wave at the same time or something. And <laughs> thank you everybody for joining. We'll see you, we'll see you next time.